Welcome to the Omni Commons. Welcome to the Psychedelic Identification Mushroom Talk with Alan Rockefeller. Woo! <laughs> yeah, make some noise. This is on the internet. Yeah. People are watching this all over the world. It's great. Um, also, happy winter solstice, guys. We're, we're crawling our way out of a cold, dark winter. Yep. And uh, it's super wet outside, so all you mushroom people are stoked right now. Yeah? Cool. Find it anything? Anything? No, okay. <laughs> Come on, look more, please. Um, let's see, also the full moon is tomorrow to coincide with this other phenomenon. That's kind of interesting. It's on my card. Um, so the building we're in, who's been to the Omni Commons before? Any any y'all? Cool, so a lot of new newcomers in the house too. Uh, it's a pretty awesome space. It's a collective of collectives. So it's a lot of different radical people doing different radical projects, everything. Uh, Food Not Bombs meets here, Fat Beats Produce is another organization, Counterculture Labs, the Synthetic Biology Lab, that um, kind of like a biohacking space is pretty awesome. Uh, that's how I got involved with this space a few years ago. And uh, what else is going on here? Oh, and also Pseudo Room, which is like a normal software and hardware hacking space. So there's a lot going on in this building. Uh, above you is like a library space, and obviously this ballroom hosts a lot of cool events. So if you ever want to get into, you know, the uh, maybe more subversive culture of Oakland, uh, but also, you know, community-based spaces, uh, is a really rad space to check out. So just keep it on your radar. Um, let's see what's next. Uh, yeah. So I'm representing the Psychedelic Society tonight. A lot of you probably found out about this space through the Psychedelic Society. Um, so thank you all for helping out with that. We're kind of carrying on a vision of Daniel Jabor, who started this group about five years ago, created a large mailing list and with a lot of passion and heart. And uh, a lot of thanks to him. He's not carrying it on anymore. He unfortunately passed away, but we're doing our best to carry it through in his vision and keep it community focused and accessible to a lot of people. So thank you all for showing out and, you know, giving us a reason to keep doing that. Really appreciate it for the support. Um, let's see. Another person that's here tonight is in the back. We have uh, Benjamin from Malama Mushrooms. He came just to, you know, to show some of the products that he's creating and selling right now with like, great medicinal mushroom stuff. Um, but additionally, they're doing some cool work in Hawaii. Um, they got a grant recently to study the native mushroom species and their medicinal benefits potentially there. So it's kind of exciting stuff uh, if you ever want to connect with him at the end of the night. Um, also, after this event, we're going to go and do a quick tour of the Counterculture Labs, which is where Alan actually spends a lot of his time um, in the off-season in Mexico doing, like, DNA sequencing. And, you know, Alan's been working in this space for, like, three or four years. Maybe longer? Three or four. <laughs> Three or four, he agrees. And uh, yeah, he's taught me some really awesome stuff, DNA sequencing for mushrooms, um, a lot of identification stuff out in the field. And I just really appreciate him as a teacher and mentor. And uh, I'm really honored to be able to put this event together and bring everybody together for this. So uh, he just got off the plane last night. So give the guy some credit if he's a little tired or woozy. Um, can you guys share some more enthusiasm with us as we move through the night, try not to fall asleep in the pews? I know they're comfortable. <laughs> um, yeah, so he just got off of five months of hunting, so I don't know how much we're going to touch on that tonight, but uh, he's get, looking forward to five or six more before he goes back to Mexico again, doing more lab work, and he, he works hard, trust me. <laughs> it's not just a, it's not a front. So, again, thank you guys all out for coming out, and uh, I'm just going to pass it off. Thank you. All right, thanks. So we got two different kinds of psychoactive mushrooms. There's psilocybin mushrooms and muscimol. So most of the psychedelic mushrooms that you hear about are the psilocybin mushrooms. And then the muscimol are the amanitas. So psilocybin mushrooms have psilocybin. And psilocybin does absolutely nothing except that it turns into psilocin. So psilocybin is a pro-drug for psilocin. So this is psilocin without the phosphoryl group. And psilocin works because it's an agonist for the 5-HT2A receptor, which is the serotonin receptor. And so serotonin is an extremely similar molecule. This is serotonin. 
And then there's a couple other alkaloids that may or may not have some sort of effect or some, some sort of change in the psychedelic trip, and that is baocystin and norbaocystin. So all of these are tryp tryptamine alkaloids that are present in the mushrooms. Muscarin from the Amanitas is a very different molecule, not even closely related. And muscarin you'll find in Amanita section Amanita. So there's a bunch of different species. Uh, easiest one to identify is Amanita muscaria. And that one is pretty common here in California under Monterey pine. And it's kind of poisonous in that um, if you eat it, you might throw up, you might not. Um, I've tried it a few times and it definitely makes me sleepy. But what I usually do is just fry it up in butter and um, it tastes really good. It's super delicious. And if I eat like four or five bites, I don't feel anything. But if I eat more like seven or eight bites, then I feel like I drank a couple beers and I get really sleepy. Um, if you eat more than that, it gets really unpleasant. And for that reason, they've never made it against the law. So muscarin. Uh, <laughs> Yep. So muscarin's not illegal yet. You can buy these on all sorts of websites. And people usually try them once or twice and usually don't get too into them because they're really just not very much fun. Um, you know, it's, it's really a lot like uh, alcohol because it affects the GABA system. Amanita xylinovolva has the same drug, muscarin, in it. It's a species from down in Mexico. And then from the Sierras in California, we have Amanita aprica. Uh, which also has muscarin. And then the brown one is Amanita pantherina, with, also with muscarin. And Amanita pantherina has this collar on the base of the stem, makes it look really distinctive. But the mushrooms that almost everyone is trying to find are the psilocybin mushrooms. So in order to find the psilocybin mushrooms, first you have to figure out which ones grow wild in your area. And so I keep a list updated on shroomery. You just Google for which mushrooms grow in my area. It comes up first thing. And it lists all of the different states in the country and all the countries in the world and which psilocybin mushrooms grow in those areas. So once you figure out which mushrooms grow in your area, then you look them up, uh, which time of the year they grow, which habitat, um, and where exactly in the area they grow. In the Bay Area, almost all the psilocybin mushrooms grow in wood chip landscaping. And so that means the wood chips that they put down just between the shrubs on college campuses and city parks. Uh, whenever the tree tr trimming companies trim a tree, they chop it up into wood chips and just spray that all over. And that's the substrate for most of the psilocybin mushrooms that we have. So once you figure out which, uh, where to go, then you just go there at the right time of the year and uh, they'll be there. And I'm doing this talk right now because right now is the peak of the psilocybin mushroom season in uh, California. Um, it started about a month ago and it's going to go for about another month. And so with this rain we just had, the time to go out there and look is now. Because um, if you wait till January, they'll be mostly gone. So mushroom identification can be tricky. Um, it's a lot like learning a foreign language and that you look at a mushroom, if you've had experience, you know exactly what it is. Um, but for somebody that hasn't really studied it too much, it's you know, like, like hearing Chinese. But luckily you're not alone. There's a lot of uh, resources on the internet that you can use to identify mushrooms. So if you take a good picture of the top of the mushroom, and even more important, the gills, and you upload that picture to mushroomobserver.org, or iNaturalist, or the Shroomery, or any one of many Facebook mushroom identification groups, there are thousands of experts out there that will identify your mushroom. And just one or two people might be wrong, but when you have thousands of people looking at all the photos that come across, um, you, you're not going to have a lot of people wrong. So if your photo is good, it's a really good, safe way to identify mushrooms. Um, my favorite one is Mushroom Observer, because everyone votes on what kind of mushroom you have, and it keeps a permanent record of everything you've ever found. So here's Mushroom Observer. Um, I just went there today and took a couple screenshots. So you can see all these different records of the different mushrooms on there. And um, this one out here, Psilocybe cerulipes, um, this is a psilocybin mushroom from the east coast of the United States. And um, we'll have more pictures of that later. And then this one over here, this one was from um, Baja California, and the guy thought it was Psilocybe alenii or Psilocybe cyanescens, but it's actually a bulbidius. So I identified that for him.
But what you can do is do an advanced search on Mushroom Observer. And um, you have these different fields. And so what I put in is psilocybe. And then I put in for the location California. So it's going to show me all of the psilocybes that have been found in California. And so here's the psilocybes from California. You can see that psilocybe elenii is the one that's fruiting really well right now. And then you can um, go click the map, and it maps all of the psilocybes. So you can see that in California, the psilocybes are concentrated along the coast. Um, there's a few from the Sierra foothills, but the majority of them are from the Bay Area here. And then if you zoom into the Bay Area, you can see they're all over Berkeley and Oakland, um, kind of out by Concord a little bit, super common in San Francisco, and then they're all down in the Bay through San Jose. Um, they're actually even more common up in the North Bay because they get a little bit more fog up there. And then another website that's really good is iNaturalist. And iNaturalist is not just mushrooms. You can install the iNaturalist app on your phone and take pictures of every plant, bird, bug, insect, animal, mushroom, lichen, and people will identify it for you. So it's a really cool way to interact with nature and keep track of everything that you've ever found. Um, so whenever I see a plant and I don't know what that plant is, I take a picture with iNaturalist and then, um, then it Go, uh, uploads there, and then some, somebody who knows a lot more about, than me about plants will identify it and keep a record of all the plants. Uh, but these are all the psilocybes that have been found in California and reported in iNaturalist. You can see there's some patches of activity up by Eureka Arcata, but it's mostly in the Bay Area, and most of that's because that's where the people are. Um, but also, like up here in the mountains, Mount Shasta, high elevation, there really are not any psilocybes. Um, it's all edible mushrooms up there. And then here's this mushroom identification forum. It's called just the mushroom identification forum on Facebook. There's a bunch of them. They're all pretty good. Um, this one's really big. There's like 140,000 people or something on there. So if you just have the Facebook app and you're out mushroom hunting, you can put it on there. And within a couple of minutes, somebody will tell you what kind of mushroom you found. So there's a rule for identifying psilocybin mushrooms that makes it really easy and safe. And that is that all mushrooms that have a black or dark purple brown spore print and the stain blue were damaged are psilocybin mushrooms. So there are some toxic mushrooms that stain blue, but they don't have a dark purple brown or black spore print. So if you spore print them, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And you see that they stain blue. And you'll see blue mushrooms, that's not always blue staining. Uh, blue staining mushroom means that in the spot that you touch it, where you damage it, it turns blue right there. It's not just blue all the time. And we'll see some more of those later. Uh, psilocybin occurs in several different genera um, throughout the mushroom kingdom. And it's interesting in that they did full genome sequencing on all of these different psilocybin genera. And except for inosibi, um, they found that the same gene was responsible for creating psilocybin. So that means that these mushrooms are not related, but psilocybin did not evolve separately eight different times. It actually only evolved separately twice. And somehow this gene got transferred from one genus to another through a process called horizontal gene transfer. And no one knows how that happened. It could have been through physical damage or more likely through a virus or bacteria. But in any case, the psilocybin genes are pretty widely distributed in the mushroom kingdom. And in North America, these are the different species that contain psilocybin. And in California, we have Copalandia bispora, which is uh, mostly down in Southern California by San Diego. Gymnopolis luteifolius is probably the world's most beautiful psilocybin mushroom, and it's also extremely common. It's also the only psilocybin mushroom that you'll find out in nature, away from the cities. Um, usually when you're looking for psilocybin mushrooms, you don't go out into the Oakland Hills, you don't go out into the forest. You go to the wood chip landscaping, the place where the people are. If you go somewhere like Jack London Square, where you have thousands of people walking by all the time, you'll find psilocybin mushrooms all over the place. But if you go out to Tilden <laughs> or like a Redwood Regional Park with all the beautiful redwood trees, you can walk for 20 years around up there. And the only psilocybin mushroom you'll find is Gymnopolis luteifolius. And that'll be growing off of pine logs. And then we have some paniola species. And the paniolas grow mostly on lawns, but occasionally horse manure. And the most widely distributed psilocybin mushroom in the world is paniola cinctulus. 
And that grows in big piles of horse manure. So sometimes where they uh, sweep the stables and they put the, um, all the manure from the stables, they'll fruit out of there, but not just one or two. Sometimes there's like 100,000 of them, just hundreds of pounds of Paniola distinctulus coming out of these horse manure piles. But we're not too close to stables here, so usually I see this in lawns and it's especially well irrigated lawns. So just regular grasses, you know, where people mow the lawn. But this one comes out in the spring as it warms up. So usually about May, if we do get any rain in May, then sometimes you'll find pineal extinctulus really common um, all over the lawns. It grows in where? Yeah, it's, it's really widely distributed for sure. <laughs> And then um, Psilocybe eleni is uh, one of the really aggressive wood chip ones. And this one's really strong. So when people are looking for psilocybin mushrooms, um, Psilocybe eleni is probably the most common one that you find. Uh, but second most common, Psilocybe cyanescens. And Psilocybe cyanescens is the wavy cap. And that grows right alongside Psilocybe eleni in the same, uh, same exact habitat. And then Psilocybe ovidio cystidiata was described from yeah, Ohio, uh, but it's turned up in San Francisco and um, in Oakland, also in the wood chip lab, uh, habitat. But Psilocybe eleni and Psilocybe cyanescens really like it cold, so they're really a December mushroom, whereas Psilocybe ovidio cystidiata uh, prefers the fruit when it gets warmer, like March, April, if you get rains that late, um, it'll start to get common. And then Psilocybe stuntsii, I was starting to think maybe we didn't have it in the Bay Area, but um, my friend Damon found it just a couple days ago here in Oakland and did some microscopy on it, and it was definitely stuntsii. So the, um, the bottom two have an annulus, like a ring around the stem, and um, they're all in wood chips in the Bay Area. But the first one we'll talk about is Psilocybe cubensis, and that's because this is the most common mushroom on the black market. Um, whenever you buy mushrooms from a dealer, it's almost always Psilocybe cubensis, and the reason for that is because it's so easy to grow. And in nature, it occurs in Texas, Louisiana, Mexico. It's described from Cuba, but it's really native to Asia. So it grows in places that have warm summer rains, and that means that you'll never find it outdoors in California unless somebody just plants a patch. But it's extremely easy to cultivate. So this one, people trade spores around all the time in the internet, and um, it's just as easy to grow as the oyster mushrooms or any of those gourmet mushrooms that sell at the farmer's market. And it looks really cool. Here's a picture of it that I took in Michoacan. And you can see it's always growing directly from cow manure, occasionally horse manure. And it has a ring on the stem, and the ring catches the spores. So everything in Psilocybe has these purple spores, and the ring catches the spores and gives it a purple ring. And they're not too strong, but they're not too weak either. People usually eat about three grams of them. And they practically grow themselves um, when people have sterile technique and grow them that way. And here's what the spores look like. Um, they're really big spores, so they end up lasting for a long time. And that's where you find them. <laughs> the Psilocybe eleni is uh, recently described. Um, it's really common in the Bay Area. It's probably the most common one that we have in the wood chips. Um, this picture, I took it down in Mountain View. And um, this patch went on for like 80 feet. So it was just like, went on forever. Um, and it was like right next to the highway where they put down fresh wood chips and it was also irrigated. And I think that had a lot to do with it um, because when it's irrigated, then it can colonize all summer. And then when the temperature drops in the fall, they can all just fruit. Um, may or may not have something to do with it, but um, I found a few of these in Oakland and I mixed them with water and just put them in a water bottle and shook up the water bottle and tossed the water on these wood chips right when I saw they put down the fresh wood chips. And then a couple of years later I found this. Um, that might have been a coincidence. <laughs> Here's a picture I took in Oakland uh, right off of MLK. Um, no, right off of Mandela Parkway. 
And um, I went by this place today, and it was fruiting. It's fruiting right now, but there's a lot of people that know about it now. So, like, they're picking them way too early, and they're not get, letting them get really big. So you can see, like, some of them, they're, like, really small. But if you wait, they'll get really big. So you don't really want to pick them really small because they'll have a whole lot more psilocybin when they get big. And you can see that they're growing directly from these wood chips. Um, they really like the red wood chips too. And you can see them on Google Maps sometimes, these red wood chip areas. So a good thing to do is just to look around uh, on uh, Google Earth for places that have these red wood chips. And you can see it's tying all the wood chips together. So the mycelium is just colonizing and eating the wood chips. And this place was pretty big. Um, there was a lot of them there. It went on for quite a ways. And when they get old, sometimes they get wavy like that, but that's not until they're like big, massive ones. And so when you find them, um, a good thing to do is to make spore prints. And so I like to make my spore prints on tin foil. So I just pinch the stems off and then put the caps, just lay them on tin foil. And then I put another layer of tin foil over the top to keep them clean and uh, let them sit overnight. And then in the morning, you take off the caps and you get something like this. And you can see they look kind of black, but they're really dark purple brown. And um, these you can use to verify that the spore print color is dark purple brown because the deadly lookalikes, which we'll see later, have mostly orange spores. So there are a couple poisonous mushrooms with dark purple brown spores like this, but nothing that'll kill you. And they don't stain blue. Psilocybe cyanescens is known as the wavy cap. And this one um, is also super common in wood chips right along the coast. So they start out looking like this. And then when they mature, the cap gets really wavy like that. And they always have very white stems. And if you scratch the white stems, they'll start stain very blue. And occasionally, they fruit really prolifically. Um, here's a picture from Germany where you can see like 10,000 of them. Um, so if there's a, a lot of wood chips, they'll just take over the whole wood chip bed and the whole thing will fruit. Where are uh, that was in Frankfurt, but I think they're pretty widely distributed all over Germany. What kind of wood chips? It doesn't really matter. I think um, if you're going to grow them, you want to use hardwood like oak or alder or maple or some kind of fruit or nut tree. But um, the wood chips that the, they put out just all over the place, they're usually Douglas fir from like a sawmill. And I don't think they like Douglas fir very much, but after a couple years, the tannins leach out and they get a lot less picky. Psilocybe cyanescens. So then Psilocybe ovodio cystidiata um, was recently described from Ohio. And the name is really long, and it talks, it's, uh, refers to the ovoid cystidia that are on the gills. So if you look at the gills under a microscope, um, we'll see a picture of that later. But the really interesting thing about ovoidio cystidiata is that it doesn't need to be really cold to fruit. So that makes it a lot easier to fruit indoors. And um, they'll just come up all summer long if you keep watering them in your yard. And they stain blue pretty good. These were bit by frost. And when the frost breaks the cell walls, then it exposes the psilocin to oxygen and turns them very blue. Um, here's some that were cultivated in Switzerland. So somebody mailed one of those spore prints to Switzerland. And um, somebody grew them all over this wood chip path. And then he said he found them a few miles down the road. So they're spreading all over Switzerland. <laughs> uh, here's some that I found in my backyard in Mountain View. Um, but you can see they have an annulus on them. And they have a very white stem. Um, there's another one with an annulus in the Bay Area, the Psilocybe stuntii, but that has a much darker stem. And microscopically, here's the cells that are on the edges of the gills, and you can see they're really wide. Um, all of the closely related species, the, the chylocystidia, they look like little tiny narrow-necked bottles, um, so they're not wide like this at all. And then the world's strongest psilocybin mushroom is Psilocybe azurescens. And this one only grows within a couple miles of the Oregon-Washington border and only right on the coast. So if you go out there, you'll see a ton of police with binoculars. And they're, <laughs> I'm not kidding, they really do. They're looking for hippies. And, um, and they make a lot of felony drug arrests out there. Um, but they probably only catch about 1% of the hippies that go out there to pick. Um, but they're extremely strong. And they grow in the, uh, the dune grasses. 
So um, really closely related to Psilocybe eleni and Psilocybe cyanescens. And they call them flying saucers because they kind of have this bump in the middle of the cap. And they're really tall. They're a lot taller than eleni or cyanescens. And they're extremely strong. People eat maybe half a gram and find that it's too much. And um, they're also really easy to cultivate outdoors. Um, that same guy that grew these other ones in Switzerland grew uh, these um, in Switzerland as well. And Psilocybe Aztecorum is a really neat one. Um, it was described from Popocatepetl, which is a volcano, um, right in the outskirts of Mexico City, which is where I was yesterday. And um, it grows only at very high elevations in Mexico. So it likes it really cold. Uh, but recently it's turned up in Colorado and Arizona as well. And at Colorado and Arizona are much further north than Mexico, so it grows at lower elevations. So it grows at middle elevations, kind of like you know, five, 6,000 feet in Colorado and Arizona. And then if you go further north in Canada, it grows at sea level. And uh, when people found it in Canada, they thought it was a new species, so they named it Psilocybe cubecensis after Quebec. But recently, a DNA sequence of the holotype of Psilocybe cubecensis uh, made its way into GenBank. And I noticed that it was exactly the same as the DNA sequence of Psilocybe aztecorum um, that I found in Nevada de Toluca. So cubecensis is just an older synonym, and aztecorum is the right thing to call it. Um, these are some that I found in Arizona. And um, we'll see the habitat in a minute. It's really beautiful. And they have like a little veil remnant. You can sort of see the spores on the veil there. But this is the spot in Arizona. And as you can see, most of Arizona doesn't look like this. But there's a few mountains in Arizona. They call them sky islands. And they're full of Engelmann spruce. And every August, it rains a lot there. And it's a very beautiful habitat. And then here's a picture that I took about two months ago in Nevada de Toluca, which is also not too far from Mexico City. And um, they can be really common up there. Like in September, October, this can be the most common mushroom out there. But in Mexico, they only grow at the very tops of the volcano. So they, um, they need this cold. And the, the habitat is very small. There's only a few square miles in Mexico where they grow. And then at the base of the stems, you see these rhizomorphs here. It makes them look really cool. So they're attaching to all of the different substrate that they grow on. And this is where I found them. Uh, the pine tree is Pinus hartwegii. And then the silver shrub is Senecio cineroides. And they really like the wood of both of those things. So um, you'll find them down underneath those plants. And if you look at the edges of the gills with the microscope, it uh, looks really cool. This is the chylocystidia on the edge. And the chylocystidia is really taxonomically significant in psilocybe. So if you're trying to identify your psilocybin mushroom, looking at the edge of the gill is what you want to do. And you can see they're really thin, narrow-necked like bottles. And if you read the books um, on psilocybe, it says that psilocybe baocystis is very closely related to psilocybe aztecorum. Um, it looks kind of similar, but if you sequence the DNA, you'll find that they're really far apart. Um, so the DNA sequencing is really revolutionizing the way we think about these psilocybes. But Baocystis grows in British Columbia and Washington and Oregon, um, so it likes it cold as well. And it grows both in wood chip landscaping and also in grass. And it's got this really cool pleated cap margin, which is really unique, and it turns really blue, which means it has a lot of psilocin in it. And like everything in psilocybe, they got these purple brown spores. And this texture of this, the uh, apex of the stem there is called pruinose. It's kind of like fine, fine dots on there. And those are cells called colocystidia, which also look really cool in the microscope. And here's some that were found in the grass. So this one's actually very closely related to psilocybe semilanciata. Um, which is a liberty cap. And microscopically, they're, um, they look a lot like liberty caps as well. Now, Psilocybe serulescens was described from Oaxaca, Mexico. Um, and it grows in landslides. So in Mexico, there's four different species of psilocybe that they call derumbes. And, um, they, that, and derumbe in Spanish means landslide. 
Um, it's also turned up in Georgia and Alabama, Mississippi, and um, South Carolina and North Carolina, Central America, Puerto Rico, South America. So the Mexican government puts up these signs. Um, they're really handy, so you know where to look for them. <laughs> and here's a photo from Kalima. Um, this is a place called Volcán de Fuego, which is an active volcano. And uh, it actually erupts pretty often with spectacular photos. But down on the side of these, this active volcano, you have all of these dry riverbeds. And um, the dry riverbeds are a really good place for organic material to ga gather and collect. So by walking up and down these dry riverbeds, you can find them um, quite a bit. And then this place is in Jalisco. And it's an old sawmill. So um, it used to be that they would cut up all the trees there. But about 15 years ago, they shut it down. And now it's just full of Psilocybe serolescens um, and Zepatocorum as well. Um, and so the sawmill just has an Im immense amount of food for them. Um, here's one that was in just a regular landslide. And um, here's one with a spore print on the top. So it's got these dark purple brown spores and then there was some grass laying on top that made a cool pattern. Um, but we found really a lot of them there. Um, at this old sawmill, and um, the first, this is a picture from 2009. It was the first time I went there. And so we gathered them all up and put them all in a big pile. And then the landowner rode up on a horse, and he was like, hey, what are you guys doing? And we said, oh, we're looking for mushrooms. And he said, oh, cool, I love mushrooms. <laughs> and yeah, Mexicans are really cool. And so he told us that we can come back whenever we want. And there's a house there, and the house is never locked, and we can stay at the house. And so, <laughs> and so we go there every year now. And um, it's a really cool place. Um, now, this is way more than anybody could possibly eat. So what we did with them is micro-remediation, and that means solving environmental problems using mushrooms. So when you find a landslide, disturbed habitat, um, some place where the humans really messed up the ground, these mushrooms are some of the first organisms that come in and stabilize the soil and turn the woody debris into good soil for the plants again. So what we did is we just filled up these boxes with the mushrooms, and then we threw them all over all these places that people messed it up so the mushrooms can uh, re rehabilitate the soil. And here is the, uh, the habitat. This is in uh, Volcán de Fuego in Colima. And um, so in the middle of this dry riverbed, there's no mushrooms at all. And then in the very sides, they're just edibles, but kind of over on the edges, not exactly up into the jungle, but just on the edges is where the Psilocybe serolescens fruits. And this is Fulvio. He's a biologist that I met on the shroomery in 2007. And this is how I got into going into Mexico. He was posting pictures of Psilocybe serolescens and Psilocybe zapatocorum. And so I messaged him, and I'm like, hey, man, can I go mushroom hunting with you? And he's like, yeah, of course. And so I just bought a plane ticket, flew into Guadalajara, and within an hour of getting off the plane, I was in the middle of a Psilocybe serolescens patch. And uh, that was 2007, so I've been going back to Mexico every year since then. And here's the fungus fair in Sangyu, Michoacan. Um, these police here, not very good at identifying mushrooms using microscopic features. <laughs> and that's good, because that's why they didn't throw me in jail. And here's the spores. Um, they're a lot smaller than Psilocybe cubensis, but they have very thick walls. Psilocybe cerulipes was described from Michigan um, but uh, when I found it, it's in Mexico. Um, it really likes the wood of beech trees. And it's a very small mushroom. So um, you can see it stains blue pretty well. And uh, this is the habitat in Mexico. Um, there's very few beech trees left in Mexico. Um, just a couple isolated pockets. But in all of these isolated pockets, and they're really tiny, they're like a couple acres, but you go there and um, Psilocybe serulipes is pretty common there. Uh, here's Alonzo Cortez Perez, um, and he is one of Gaston, uh, the last student of Gaston Guzman. So Gaston Guzman was the uh, Mexican psilocybe expert who wrote all of the books and described a whole lot of psilocybe species. And he died a couple years ago. Um, and so Alonzo was the last person to work with him. 
A really rare one is Psilocybe cyanofibrillosa. And this one only grows in Washington and um, British Columbia. And it's only been found a couple times. Um, but luckily, one of the times, um, somebody sent a, a little bit of it to Jan Borovicka in Czechoslovakia, and he made some DNA sequences. So now we can see how, it's, uh, how it is phylogenetically, and also we can identify it accurately using DNA. And it's unique in that it has this really forked chylocystidia. So lots to be Jaimei. It was described from Oaxaca, um, but it's even more common in Veracruz. But this is actually a very rare mushroom, and I've been finding it for years, but usually when I find it, there's one. If I'm really lucky, there'll be three. But about two months ago, I found about 30 of them, which is way more than I've ever found in one spot before. And this was um, in Veracruz in the mountains above Jalapa. And Jalapa is one of the coolest places in Mexico. Um, people there are really friendly, it's really safe, but the whole like mountain above Jalapa is all cloud forest. And cloud forest is the most diverse habitat on Earth, and it's the best habitat for psilocybin mushrooms. So you get quite a few different species. And psilocybe hymiae is really unique in that the gills are orange uh, when it starts out, and then as it matures, the gills turn uh, dark purple brown. And it's a really hard mushroom to see because it's really small and it's always very dark brown. And nobody's ever tried to cultivate it yet. Psilocybe hopii um, is the most recently described psilocybin mushroom from the United States. And it only grows in one mountain in the whole world. And that is the San Francisco Peaks, which is above Flagstaff in Arizona. And um, you know, I read about these things, and I figured I would never see them. But um, two years ago, I had some, um, had some time in the southeast and decided to contact the guys that discovered these things. So I dug into the literature, and I found um, the guy that described Psilocybe Hopii. And I emailed him, and he actually emailed me back. And he's like, oh, yeah, you can come mushroom hunting. And so um, I went there and, uh, and found some of them. And so Psilocybe hopii is really closely related to Psilocybe cyanescens. Um, looks a lot like Azure essence as well. And it's extremely rare. Um, the guy that discovered it has only found them in two different spots. And he has not found them anymore in those original spots. Um, but he took some spore prints and he brought it home and he cultivated them on grain spawn and kind of put the grain and some wood chips back out in the forest near where he found them. And so there's a couple patches where they come up there. Um, if it wasn't for that effort, these may go extinct. One of the coolest looking mushrooms is Psilocybe huxiginii. And Psilocybe huxiginii is really hard to find. Um, in Mexico, it only grows in Oaxaca. It also grows in Central America. So it took me 10 years to find this mushroom, um, just looking every, you know, for a couple weeks every year in the mountains. And finally, last year, I found it. And you can see it's really unique looking. It's got this really acute umbo in the very top. It smells really strong like cucumber, um, which is like, smells a lot like Psilocybe Mexicana. And here's a picture that I took a couple months ago. And this was in Sierra Mije, which is an extremely remote Sierra in Oaxaca, um, where almost no one ever goes. Here's one that was collected in 1959 by Gordon Wasson, preserved in alcohol. And one collected by Maria Sabina, who is the Mazatec lady who uh, introduced psilocybin mushrooms to the Western world. And here's the spot that I found it in. Um, it was this, really, this edge of a mossy landslide. Now, the rarest psilocybin mushroom um, known is Psilocybe meridionalis. It's only been found one time. So um, every time I go to Mexico, I go looking for it, but I've never found it. Um, it only grows in this one mountain. It's very remote, Sierra and Jalisco. And uh, after looking for it for about three years and just not being able to find it anywhere, I decided to go study the holotype. So when you discover a new species, you collect a type collection and you deposit it in the herbarium. And that becomes the official record of uh, what the species is. And so I went to the herbarium and found the holotype of Psilocybe meridionalis. And I was in luck because it had nice collection notes and it had GPS coordinates. 
And uh, so I went out there. And this is the exact hillside where it was discovered. Uh, but it wasn't there. So I'm going to keep looking for it. <laughs> Psilocybe mescaleroensis was described from New Mexico. And most of New Mexico is very dry, but there's this one spot in the middle of New Mexico that gets a whole lot of rain. And that is the only mountain in the world where Psilocybe mescaleroensis grows. And I figured I would never see it, um, but the guy that discovered it was named Lee Wallstad. And so um, I Googled for him and uh, found some YouTube videos of his that turned up. And so I messaged him on YouTube, and he responded. And he's like, yeah, well, yeah we can go mushroom hunting. Um, so this is Lee Wallstad. Um, he's a very eccentric guy. Um, and so we went out there, and after a few days, we finally found them. So this is Psilocybe mescaloroensis. And these are really unique in that they have an annulus around the stem. And this is the habitat that it grows. Psilocybe mexicana is probably the strongest psilocybin mushroom in Mexico. Um, it's also turned up in Guatemala, and it fruits pretty early in the year. So right at the start of the rains, June, July are the best times to find it. It starts to trail off in August. Um, it's really cool looking, and it grows in grass. So I always like pastures with horses, but it never grows in horse manure. It always grows directly from the grass. And this has the strongest smell out of any psilocybin mushroom. So you know, it just looks like your average little brown mushroom. But if you pick it up and smell it, it smells really strongly like cucumber. And these are pretty commonly cultivated. Um, there's a couple species of psilocybe that um, create sclerotia, which are these kind of nodules that form. And this is one of them. These are pictures from Guadalajara. And they have this cool coordinate veil. And then the gills turn purple as the spores mature. Another durumbe in Mexico is Psilocybe malircula. And this one we call the high elevation durumbe because it grows really high up. Um, I found it in Michoacan, District Federal, Puebla, Veracruz, and Oaxaca. So this is Popocatepetl. And uh, this here is a cloud. But then this here is steam that's coming out of the active volcano. And so when I went to take this picture and check my Psilocybe malircola spots, the police had a roadblock set up. And they said that it was too dangerous because the volcano was erupting and that nobody could uh, go into the park at this time. So I turned around and went back the other way and snuck in through Puebla. And um, I was able to get this picture that way. And then here's the habitat that we find it in. So like Sabre Lessons, it grows in these dry stream beds. Um, it's really dark volcanic soil. And in the middle, there's no mushrooms at all. And then in the edges, there's a lot of edibles, a lot of swillis and amanitas and porcini. But then on these walls here, just the walls of the dry riverbed, is where Psilocybe malircola turns up. And you can walk for miles down these dry riverbeds and find Psilocybe malircola every couple hundred yards. Um, this spot here is the best spot in the world that I found for Psilocybe malircola. They're there every year. And uh, you like to grow under this log here. And then here's a picture from Nevada de Toluca. Um, so these are all really high elevation areas, and it gets really cold up there. And you can see it's staining blue pretty well on the stem. And here's a spore print of Psilocybe malircola. So this is a spore print on tin foil. And I took this picture with my cell phone with the flash, but I held the camera at an angle to the tin foil, so most of the light bounced away, and, uh, and it lets you see the purple color really well. Psilocybe neohalopensis um, is really common in Veracruz and also turned up in Oaxaca. Um, it's really cool looking. And this one's really unique in that most of the psilocybes, you find them in like these really disturbed areas that people disturbed. But Psilocybe neohalopensis grows way out in the middle of nowhere, uh, very far from human disturbance. And it always grows in these mossy hills. And it smells like cucumber and oil paint. And like everything in Psilocybe, the gills turn purple as the spores mature. And it's really cool looking. And it's pretty potent. 
And here's the habitat here. It um, grows in this mossy area right here. And Psilocybe pelliculosa is extremely common in clear cuts and logged areas up in Washington and Oregon and Northern California. Um, this picture here is the furthest south that it's ever been found. And this is a picture that I took in Salt Point State Park. Um, so if you want to go to Salt Point State Park and you want to look for it, you just go to Stump Beach and then there's a trail that goes up the hill and you take the trail up the hill a couple hundred yards and it was there right on the edge of the trail. Uh, but in clear cuts, um, which luckily they don't do in California too much, but like in Oregon and Washington, sometimes you'll see 100,000 of these in the clear cuts. And they look a lot like Gallerina, but the Gallerina is a poisonous, but you can see the gills are starting to turn purple. And in Gallerina, as the spores mature, the gills turn orange. So it's really important to pay attention to what color the gills turn as the spores mature. And then Psilocybe semi-lanceata is known as Liberty Caps. And these, in California, they only grow in the north end of the state. So I find them up by Oric. They grow in Eureka, Arcata, all along Highway 1, um, up to the Oregon, Washington area. And they grow directly in grass, and they have very little psilocin. So psilocin is the chemical that stains blue. And so these barely stain blue at all. Um, if you really beat them up, they will stain blue just a little bit. Um, but usually there's no blue on them at all. And they're extremely potent, so even though they don't have much psilocin, they have a lot of psilocybin. And they're also the world's most widely distributed psilocybe. They grow in all over Europe, and Russia, and South America, and also in Australia. And psilocybe stuntsii is pretty common up in Washington and Oregon. And it's pretty rare in, in California, but it turned up in Oakland just this week. So it's got a ring around the stem, like Ovodio cystidiata, but unlike Ovodio cystidiata, it has a much darker stem. So Ovodio cystidiata has a whiter stem, and this is really dark. It turns up in wood chips and also in grass. And the common name for these is blue ringers, because a lot of times the ring turns blue. And then Psilocybe subtropicalis is described from Oaxaca, um, but I find it more often in Veracruz. And in Mexico, this is the only Psilocybe that grows in oak duff. So usually, um, I found Psilocybe in grass or with uh, pine, but this one really likes oak trees, and it likes open areas, so if you have a big, beautiful pasture, and then these oak trees, they're really picturesque, um, you'll find Psilocybe subtropicalis under them. Um, this is a picture that I took about a month ago in Veracruz. And here's the habitat that we found them in. And they like to grow on these open hillsides here. So it to be young Gensis is one of my favorite ones to photograph. This one um, is described from Oaxaca, but it also turns up in Puebla, Veracruz, Jalisco, and Tamaulipas. And it's really unique in that it grows directly from logs. Um, it's the only psilocybe in Mexico that you'll find growing directly from logs. And it's really thin and um, really cool looking. So these are some pictures that I took in Jalisco. And you can see the cap is really thin. You can almost see through them here. Um, and then in this picture here, you can see there's a little bit of an umbrella here. So these had full sunlight on them, and mushroom pictures never turn out well with full sunlight. So I put this white umbrella up there. And then down here, there's a river. And so I set up my tripod in the river and then put a reflector there. So the reflector bounces light up onto the gills and the upper stem. And then I set the camera. I used like a uh, Canon DSLR with a macro lens. I set the camera for like F16, ISO 100, two-second exposure. And it turned out pretty well. And they start out like this, and then when they get mature, they end up looking like this, and then get wavy sometimes. The last psilocybe that we'll look at is psilocybe zapatocorum. And psilocybe zapatocorum is another durumbe, so it grows in landslide mushrooms. It's probably the most potent durumbe in Mexico. It grows usually in um, near water, in disturbed ground. You can see it looks really cool. It's got this really scaly stem, and the cap gets really wavy. Um, this is from that same sawmill in Jalisco. 
And then this is from another spot in Jalisco. And then here's some from Michoacan. And they grow really commonly near water, so we had to get wet to take pictures of these. Um, you can see that Alonzo is photographing this, picture, this cluster of psilocybe zapatocorum right here. And um, here's some, my picture of this cluster. We thought it was so cool looking that we didn't pick it, we just left it there. Um, but a couple hours later, um, we, saw, we ran in some hippies, and um, they had this exact cluster in the back of their car. <laughs> It stains blue um, quite a bit. Um, and this one, the spores have not matured yet, so the gills were more of a cream color. And that let me pinch it and make the silicon oxidize and get this nice blueing photo. Here's some in Oaxaca. And in Oaxaca, all of the people, all the natives, um, they've been eating th this species for thousands of years. And they use them medicinally and also for the ceremonies. Um, so they're very hard to find in Oaxaca because people pick them and they know exactly where they grow. Um, but in Jalisco, the people there don't know anything about these. So they're, um, <clears throat> they're pretty easy to find in Jalisco. And I think they're equally common in both places, it's just that they get them in Oaxaca. And this is the habitat that you find them in. Um, this is some of the most dangerous mushroom hunting that you can possibly do, is in these landslides in Mexico. Um, you know, the rain comes in about 3 p.m. every day, and all these boulders start falling, and, you know, they're, it's at a really steep angle, so um, it's a lot of fun. And really beautiful areas, too. You can see this is all cloud forest, so really good plant diversity, and really good mushroom diversity as well. Uh, this is the spot in Michoacan that I found them. And then there's a couple other different genera that also have psilocybin in them. Um, Copalandia cyanescens grows in Texas and Alabama and Florida and Mexico. And it grows directly from cow manure. And unlike psilocybin, it's got jet black spores. So that means the gills turn jet black when it um, matures. And then here's a picture that I took in San Jose. These are growing in my friend's closet. Um, they're pretty easy to cultivate, but they're a lot more potent than Psilocybe cubensa, so they're usually not cultivated. And they need a little bit warmer temperature, so people cultivate them with a heat pad. But they have a lot of psilocin in them, so when you break the stem, it turns blue pretty well. And here's a picture that I took in Queretaro. And then Foliotina smithy is a really scary one to eat. Uh, Foliotina smithy looks almost exactly like a deadly gallerina. Um, in the deadly mushrooms, the gills start out kind of cream colored, and then as the spores mature, the gills turn orange because they have orange spores. And this uh, Foliotina smithy also has orange spores. They don't grow in California. They grow in all of the states that border Canada and in Canada, so they really like it cold. Gymnopolis luteus is all over the East Coast. It's really big, um, and sometimes there's a whole lot of them on the logs. This one does not grow in California. The California gymnopolis that contains psilocybin is gymnopolis thirzii. And we actually have a couple different species um, here. But they're really beautiful because they start out bright purple. And, um, and here's a picture that I took in Oakland. Um, just in this wood chip landscaping right by my house. And um, they're, yeah, really cool looking and they have these rusty orange spores, but you don't really confuse them for a deadly gallerina because these are a lot bigger than a deadly gallerina and also the deadly ones are not bitter, whereas these are super bitter. And then Paniola cinctulus is the most widely distributed one. It grows in all 50 U.S. states. It grows in every country in the world. And you'll find it on horse manure. So this is um, horse manure. You see it's got the jet black spores. And this is really common on lawns, too. And the Senate, of course. And then it's got these model gills. So um, inequi hymeniferous is the term for the spores maturing at different times. So it makes these gills have these blotches on them. Makes them look pretty unique. And um, then the last one that we'll look at, Pluteus americanus, um, is pretty rare. 
Uh, I think the one that we have that looks like this in California is Pluteus phaeocyanopus. I usually find it like once every other year. Um, but Pluteus, unlike all the other psilocybin mushrooms we've looked at, it has pink spores. They're like really salmon colored and they grow on really well decayed wood. Pluteus sape is super rare, but you can see it's staining blue pretty well. So here's a mushroom that's purple. Um, it's not a psilocybin mushroom. This one is a look-alike. Um, this one's edible. I've eaten it a few times. It tastes like leaves, so it's kind of good. Um, but <laughs> it's really purple, but no matter how much you beat it up, it doesn't turn color at all. So the psilocybin mushrooms change color in the spots that you damage them. And um, in this picture, the, the, uh, the spores showed up really well. So it's got these orange spores that fell out of the gills and landed on the stem. And then another one um, that's really blue are these entolomas. Um, this was pretty cool. It was like eight inches tall and um, found this in Oaxaca. Uh, but again, no matter how much you damage this mushroom, it doesn't turn any bluer. And here's another entoloma from Veracruz. Um, beautiful cobalt blue sheen on it. And no matter how much you beat it up, it doesn't turn any bluer. Um, now here's the most common mushroom that you find in the spring in California. This one looks a lot like Psilocybe cubensis. So people are always saying they found cubensis when they found it. But it's called Loridiomyces percivalii. And it's not hallucinogenic. But you, everybody in this room will see this mushroom 100 times in the spring, um, especially like February, March. It's like in every lawn, in every city park. It's everywhere. And this one's not really a lookalike, uh, but it is a good indicator. So this one is the Radiomyces series, and it's bright red, and it grows in wood chip landscaping right alongside Psilocybe alenii, Psilocybe cyanescens. So a lot of people, like in Golden Gate Park, they'll like run around looking at the wood chip beds, looking for these bright red mushrooms, and when they see them, they'll stop, and then very carefully look around for the Psilocybes that are often nearby. Here is Parasola conopola. It's super common. I have about 50 of them on the table back there that you can look at. Um, these are not poisonous. Uh, they're not hallucinogenic. They're just edible. You can eat them, but they don't really have that much flavor or texture. But they're super common. You'll see them in like every wood chip bed ever. And the really easy way to recognize them is they're super fragile. So the stem breaks really easily and the cap breaks really easily. And um, if you break the cap, the cap always breaks up into these triangular sections. So if a triangle piece breaks off, then you know, oh yeah, it's one of those. And then here's a really cool one, Mycena amicta. And this one is the Mycena that grows in wood chips. And this, the base of the stem is really blue. However, in psilocybin mushrooms, the blue staining is persistent. And that when it dries out, it still stays blue, kind of turns black sometimes from being really blue. But in these, when it starts to dry out, the blue just disappears. And that's a clue that this is a completely different chemical, um, not psilocin at all. And here's a picture that I took today, Mycena leptocephala. And these are also on that white table in the back there. And these are kind of cool because they smell really strongly like bleach. And they're super common. Um, I went mushroom hunting in the Google campus once and saw about 100,000 of them. And then here is Tuberia furfuracea. Um, this is like the quintessential little brown mushroom that you'll see in every single yard in California and every wood chipped area. Um, a lot of times in the wood chipped areas, there'll be like 100,000 of them. And you can see that they have these orange spores. So when people start out, they always think that they found the deadly gallerina. Uh, but actually, the deadly gallerina is kind of rare on wood chips. Um, these are about 100,000 times more common. And then when the cap starts out, it starts out this caramel color. But it very quickly dries out and turns white. There's very dramatic color changes it dries out. This one is deadly poisonous. This is gallerina marginata. And Gallerina marginata usually is found on really well decayed wood. Like this log's been right next to this waterfall for a long time and started to decay. And Gallerina marginata has kind of orange spores, so the gills turn really orange as it gets mature. 
and it's got this kind of brownish stem. Sometimes the stem is green at the base, but no matter how much you beat it up, it doesn't turn any greener. Here's some Gallerina marginata that I took, uh, took this picture down in Mountain View, um, right next to some Psilocybe alenii patches. So these um, are deadly poisonous and they have a toxin called alpha ammonitin in them. So if you eat them, nothing happens for about 12 hours, but it stops your body from being able to synthesize proteins. So without new proteins, after about 12 hours you get really sick and then after a week you die. And um, you can save yourself, but um, you have to get a liver transplant to save yourself and a, a liver is about $800,000 with installation. What's that? Oh yeah, you can take uh, alpha lipoic acid and it might, um, might save you a little bit. Um, also there's um, the silymarin in milk thistle, saves you a little bit as well. And there's, um, they recently found that there's an antibiotic and if you take the antibiotic, it's like a really common antibiotic, I forget which one, um, that saves you as well. But you got to take them like really quick right after you take these. If you wait till you get sick, then none of these things really help very much. Um, so this is really what people are watching out for. You can see it's got a ring on the stem and the ring on the stem turns orange because it gets spores on them. And if you see these a bunch of times, it's really easy to separate these from psilocybe because they st the gills start out cream color and then the gills turn orange as it gets more and more mature. So when you're picking psilocybe, you really want to pay attention to how the gills are changing as the mushroom matures. Here's another one that's deadly poisonous. Um, this is from the UC Berkeley campus. It's called fo uh, Foliotina utrocystidiata. And um, not super common, but the really cool thing to notice about this is this really distinct ring on the stem. Uh, it falls off pretty easily and you can slide it up and down the stem. And then um, this is the last mushroom that we'll look at today, getting to the end, and then I'll take questions. Um, this is Foliotina rugosa. And this one's also deadly poisonous and has the same alpha ammonitin toxin that the Amanita, um, Amanita fluoroides has. So it's the same toxin as the death cap and the same toxin as Gallerina marginata. So there's really only four or five people in the world that study psilocybe. Um, one of them is Virginia Ramirez. So this is Virginia Ramirez here. Uh, she lives in Oaxaca. I think she just moved to um, Guadalajara to study psilocybe with Laura Guzman. And she does uh, molecular work. So she's doing DNA sequencing. And she published the first phylogenetic tree of psilocybe, which completely revolutionized um, the way that we understand the genus fits together. And then um, to her right is Alonso Cortez Perez. And uh, Alonzo and I uh, hunt mushrooms a lot. I just stayed in his house for a couple months. And um, we go all over Mexico just um, looking for psilocybe and all sorts of different mushrooms as well. Um, right now Alonzo is focusing on the bioluminescent mushrooms, so the mushrooms that glow in the dark. Um, and we've discovered about 25 different species of uh, mushrooms that glow in the dark in Mexico. And those are some of the most fun to hunt because we walk, um, you know, in the middle of the night, we just walk all night with no flashlights or anything and just look for things that glow. And um, we've got a bunch of papers and publication uh, giving some of these mushrooms names. Um, here, Alonzo is photographing Psilocybe hymii. And here is Laura Guzman. Um, in this picture, she's being interviewed by the, the Vice television crew. Um, to do that documentary that came out a couple years ago. Um, Laura Guzman teaches at the University of Guadalajara in Zapopan, and she is definitely uh, one of the best mycology teachers in the world. Uh, her students just love her. She's really engaging and very, does very precise work. Um, so if you get a chance to study with her, um, definitely don't pass up the opportunity. And then the last person that also studies psilocybe is Jan Borovicka. And Jan Borovicka lives in Czechoslovakia. Um, he's a really cool guy. He does, works at this uh, nuclear research lab and um, studies magic mushrooms at the nuclear research lab. Um, sometimes he visits the United States and we hang out and look for mushrooms. Um, he does a lot of DNA sequencing work as well. So then the last thing I have for you is um, we're doing 
Um, now that the rains have come, we're doing like tons of mushroom hunting. So um, the next few days, we're going to be mush mushroom hunting every day. So if you want to learn mushroom identification, the best way to do it is to go out into the field. And so <clears throat> we're going to run this mushroom hunt tomorrow. Um, and we're going to meet at the Lower Pinehurst Trailhead of Huckleberry Preserve at 11 in the morning. And so um, Huckleberry Preserve is up there in the hills. And it's a place where you're not allowed to pick mushrooms, so we'll mostly be taking pictures of mushrooms. Um, but on the map, this is where we're meeting. There's Pinehurst Road there, and it kind of bends around. Anyway, if you just put Lower Pinehurst Trailhead into Google Maps, then um, you will, you'll, it'll come right up. We'll see a bunch of people there at 11. And um, this place is kind of cool because it's way out in the middle of the woods. So it's a beautiful place to hunt mushrooms. There's a lot of trails, but there's no psychoactive mushrooms there. So it's a really good place to learn about edible mushrooms and a really good place to learn about poisonous mushrooms. Um, but for psilocybin mushrooms, you've got to hunt down in the cities. So Sunday, we're going to hunt in the city. Um, and this one, we're going to meet at 2 p.m. At, uh, in Berkeley at the corner of Oxford and Center Street. And uh, walk around from about 2 to 5. And um, these mushrooms are still illegal, so we're not going to pick them. We're just going to look around and identify every single mushroom that we find. Um, we can pick edibles. We can look at the poisonous mushrooms. And if we come across any psychedelic mushrooms, we'll just take pictures and leave them there. So that's just about all I have for you. Um, I can take questions in a minute, um, but the last thing is I've said a lot of things in this, um, in this talk, so if you want to just download my slides and flip through them and look at them a little bit more leisurely, you can go to this URL and um, you can see my PowerPoint that I just, um, just made today and uploaded there. Yep, I could, I could, could do that for sure. Thank you very much. And in a couple minutes, um, we'll hang out here for just a couple minutes and then we'll go into Counterculture Labs. And Counterculture Labs is right behind us and it's a biohacker space. So. Um, one of the coolest laboratories in the Bay Area. Um, we do all sorts of different science there, and it's open to the public. Um, you can join for not too much money and get 24-7 access to the laboratory. We do a lot of um, sterile cultivation work there, so you can grow mushrooms, um, not the illegal ones, though. Um, and we can also do a lot of DNA sequencing there. So we extract the DNA from plants and mushrooms and fungus and bacteria and um, do all sorts of cool identification stuff there. Um, we'll probably do some DNA sequencing workshops so people can bring in mushrooms that they think might be new species and we'll sequence the DNA. And we're also going to do some microscopy workshops to teach you how to use a microscope to identify mushrooms. Um, so if you stay, go to meetup.com um, and put in Counterculture Labs, you can see all the different events that are happening in Counterculture Labs. And if anybody has any questions, I can take them now. Okay. I also have a mic uh, back okay. here. I can hand it. And if we could turn on the lights too, um, so I can see people. Awesome. Okay. Y'all point to people. <laughs> um, right in the front, yeah. Um, I, <clears throat> this isn't exactly a, a fungus question, but I read about they found these organisms that aren't plant, animal, f or fungus. Do, do you know anything about that? Um, <laughs> organisms that are not plant, animal, or fungus. I think there's a bunch of them like that. They have like protus and slime molds. Um, slime molds are not even molds, they're like more closely related to amoebas. And then there's like, they discovered some new kingdom like a month ago. And yeah, that's know, what I, I'm talking about. And yeah, it, it, I, I, I don't read, know much about it, but they're really okay. common. And they're well, everywhere in soil. Okay. Because one of the things I read was really simplistic and the other one was super complex. And I was wondering like, what makes them not plant, met, or animal, or fungus, but still alive? Yeah, I mean, they've been living in the soil for millions of years and are evolving, and they're on their own se separate path. So they're just like, they split off from plants and animals millions and millions of years ago, and they're just on their own trajectory now. And that's pretty cool.
Uh, yep. Quick question. How quickly do you get the blue color when you do damage to the stem of psilocybe uh, fungus? It really depends on the, um, the concentration of psilocin. Some psilocybin mushrooms have a lot of psilocin, some have very little. All have at least some. So usually when I find psilocybin mushrooms in the wild, there's already a little bit of blue on them if you really know where to look. And then if you beat them up, usually within 10 seconds to 30 seconds, sometimes up to a minute um, to, to turn blue. Uh, yep. Hi, Alan. Thanks for a great talk. Um, I was wondering, for those who are going out and um, hunting and foraging for these mushrooms, would you suggest an etiquette um, and also, you know, respect for the environment in terms of how much to collect or when to collect or just considerations to keep in mind? Yeah, so mushrooms are way different than plants um, in that when you pick a plant, it's gone and, and then it's dead and it doesn't like that. So when you're harvesting plants, um, it's really important not to over harvest and um, you know, leave a lot, a lot of the plants there. Mushrooms are completely different in that the whole, most of the organism is underground in the mycelium. So if you pick the mushroom, it's kind of like picking the apple off of a tree. And the whole reason the mushroom is there is because it's completely colonized as substrate and it's ready to move to a new spot. So the mushrooms are the fungus' way of moving to a new spot. So it's not really bad to pick them and you don't really need to leave anything behind. Um, but it's really nice, like if you see a beauty, really cool looking beautiful mushroom near a trail, just leave it for other people because a lot of people are going to see that mushroom. But if you're really far from a trail or somewhere that people aren't going to be really seeing it, it doesn't really matter uh, how many you pick or how many you leave. Um, they've done study plots where they pick every mushroom in the study plot for 30 years and the same amount comes back whether you just rip them out of the ground or whether you carefully cut them out of the ground or whether you just leave them um, no picking whatsoever. Uh, yep, in the back. Well, you know, the Psilocybe cyanescens definitely has the wavy cap, but there's a lot of mushrooms with wavy caps that are not Psilocybe cyanescens, so that's not really something that I look at. But definitely the blue staining. Um, and also, you know, they really only grow in certain environments. Um, especially in the Bay Area, you're really looking in wood chip landscaping. And you're looking for mushrooms that have a white stem, because um, the cyanescens, the Alenii, Ovodio cystidiata, they all have white stems. And they all have purple spores. So you don't even really need to take them home to make a spore print. A lot of times you can see on the adjacent mushroom or on a leaf or on a blade of grass right next to it, um, there'll be a purple color there. And that'll save you five or six hours of spore printing time. And then just really want to pay attention to how the gills change color. So you'll find young ones and you'll find old ones and you'll find maybe really old ones. And in the really old ones, the gills will be like a really dark purple brown color. And then in the medium ones, the gills are starting to be turned kind of a purple color. And then in the young ones, the gills will be a kind of a cream color. And usually, if you look really closely at the stem, you can see some spores deposited on the veil remnants and not just on the stem. So you don't really need to spore print them because nature has already done that for you. If you just pay close attention and look, um, look carefully on the stem, you'll be able to see some spores um, almost all the time. And then if you think you found, um, also, you know, there's a lot of lookalikes out there. Most of the lookalikes are really fragile. So you touch them and they break apart really easily. The caps break into triangular sections. The psilocybes are pretty tough mushrooms. Like you can beat them up, you can throw them around, and they'll pretty much stay intact. Um, they're kind of rubbery, you bend them all different directions and they don't snap. Um, so that's another thing to look at. And then if you think you found something, um, just you know, post the pictures online. There's all sorts of places online. We get all sorts of mushroom identification experts, um, mushroom observer and iNaturalist and all these Facebook groups. Um, probably the best Facebook group um, for you people here is called the California Mushroom Identification Forum, 
because it's based in California. There's a lot of people on there, and the people that are in the California Mushroom Identification Forum are the people that wrote all of the California mushroom books. So they're like the best of the best of the experts. And um, so if you post something on there, as long as your picture is pretty good and gets a like, nice clear shot of the gills, um, you'll get a really solid answer there. Well, Psilocybe semilanciata grows in grass, but you've got to go up north past Eureka for that. So never really in grass areas here, except that you know, they don't really care about the grass here. So you will find Psilocybe cyanescens and Psilocybe alenii in grass in the Bay Area, but it's because they escaped from a wood chip bed that's nearby. So like once they run out of food in the wood chip beds, sometimes they'll keep fruiting on the grass for a few years. And then pineal acinctulus, which comes up when it gets warmer, like April and May, that one grows exclusively with grass. Mm -hmm. Yep. When you refer to the age of the mushroom as say, really young or really old, what do you mean? Is that a matter of hours or days? Um, it's usually about a week. You know, some mushrooms are really fast and they fruit really quickly and then they're gone within a day. But the psilocybin mushrooms usually have a lifespan of maybe one to two weeks. Um, and you just got to kind of get some experience with it and you'll notice, like, you know, you'll see how they look, how they change um, day to day and how they look when they're like, you know, really old and just about to turn into a pile of slime and how they look when they're just coming out. And um, after a while, you'll get a feel for it and you'll just be able to look at a mushroom and you'll know how old it is. And, You'll just be able to look at it, and if you know how old it is and what stage of development it is, you'll know which color the gills should be if it's a psilocybin mushroom. So if it just came out, it should have cream colored gills. And if it's like really old, it should have like really dark purpley gills. And if it's somewhere in between, then the gill color will be somewhere in between the two. Yep. <laughs> if you're new to IDEEN, the, uh, the psilocybe mushrooms, and it stains blue, do you have to take the spore print to an expert and show it to them? Or if the spore print is dark enough and it stains blue, you can feel certain it's uh, psilocybe? I think um, the purple color is pretty easy to identify. I think an expert would just be like, yep, that's purple. Um, you know, it's, really, <laughs> it's always really smart just the first few times to post it on the internet just so you're not paranoid. Because you know, some of these mushrooms grow in wood chips, they are deadly poisonous. And it's been a long time since anyone's poisoned themselves um, with any of these mushrooms. But you know, you'll get really paranoid and you'll think like, oh, what if one of those mushrooms that I ate was the wrong one? And um, that doesn't really happen, but still it makes you paranoid and then you'll have a bad time. So you definitely want to show an expert um, the first few times. Um, but you don't really need to make a spore print because the spores will almost always be visible without making a print. Um, the prints are more for cultivation. And if you find a lot of psilocybin mushrooms, it is a really good idea to make a lot of spore prints. Um, and also, you know, they're, su they're super illegal. So if you, sell, you know, find psilocybin mushrooms and you sell them, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. Um, but selling the spore prints, is a lot, you make a lot more money than you will selling psilocybin mushrooms. And you get in a whole lot less trouble. And, you know, if you give someone mu a mushroom, they trip once. But if you give them a spore print, they can cultivate for the rest of their lives. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, up in front here. Um, sure. Uh, I, I've heard other people say that disturbing the mycelia can be damaging, and, and maybe that was more with uh, symbiotic mushrooms. Yeah, that's kind of true. Um, in the you know, if you if you mess up the mycelium, it'll get kind of pissed off, and it won't fruit till the next year. So um, you definitely don't want to like you know claw up the mycelium a whole lot. Um, so I think the best way to pick psilocybin mushrooms, if you want there to be more mushrooms later on, is you gently pull the mushroom out of the ground, and then you clip the stem base off with your thumbnail or with a scissors, and then the stem base has got a couple of wood chips attached to it, and you plant that nearby, the next wood chip bed over, that doesn't have any psilocybin mushrooms growing, um, especially if the wood chips were just put down there recently, like they're kind of fresh, they're not gray, like they've been sitting for a couple years, but they're kind of new. And that's how they spread around, and so, um, you know, one patch will turn into 10 patches and 100 patches. And so, um, you know, that's the be definitely the best way to pick them is just to take that stem base and plant them in the next wood chip patch over. Is there much of a difference in concentration between the head and the stem? No, it's all pretty strong, and um, there's not a whole lot of difference between the stem and the cap. Yep, to the right there. Uh, as far as the weather, is it what, how long after? 
after it rains, is it going to go to go look? Is there a certain time of day that's best? And do they, and uh, as far as the ones on the wood chips, do they prefer um, to not be in direct sun, or, uh, or do, they need the, do they need the sun to, to grow? So the weather, it takes a few days from the fruit, but it's always kind of like misting and fog, foggy at night. So really, you should be checking every day, um, different wood chip spots every day. Um, you know, when it's been raining a lot, definitely check more, but there's not like a certain number of days after it rains. Um, just the more that it rains, the more you should be out there checking. And if it's not raining very much, they'll only be in irrigated areas. So it might take you pr probably about four hours to find a new patch. Whereas if the season's really good, um, you'll find like a new spot, like maybe once an hour or something like that. And, um, you know, they take a couple weeks to grow. So you don't, there's no certain time of the day that's best. Um, they'll be out there for a while. And was there one more that I forgot? Oh, there's, yeah. So they really like it um, when it's been watered, you know, the high humidity areas. So if it's, you know, direct sun hitting it, then it's only going to be fruiting when the season's really good. So when, like, the rains are coming every day for a couple weeks, then the direct sun areas will be fruiting. Um, usually the season's not quite that good, so it's more like the shady corners, the places that get irrigated, um, will be fruiting um, more than the sunny areas. Uh, yes? Aluminum foil is really good for a few reasons. Um, one thing is that there's no mushrooms with tinfoil colored spores. So, you'll know, um, so even if the spores are white or black or anything in between, you'll be able to see them um, really well. And they photograph really well because you can hold your camera or a cell phone with the flash and hold it at an angle. So the, most of the flash bounces off away from the lens, but then the spore print will reflect some of the uh, color and light back um, at the lens, and you'll get the really good sense of the color. Um, and also, if you ever want to cultivate or use them, um, the spore print for microscopy, then um, it's really good to have it on tinfoil, because if you have it on paper, you, know, you scrape up the paper, and the paper is never sterile. And, um, you'll have all sorts of paper fibers that are kind of making your mount really thick and you'll never be able to force all the spores into the same focal plane to get a really good picture with the microscope. Uh, and if you wanted to cultivate, you know, you can scrape it off uh, the tin foil and you know, the inside of the roll of a tin foil roll is very sterile and it stays really clean. So you won't have like mold and bacteria and all sorts of weird stuff growing. You'll only have the spores that you put onto the agar germinating. Hmm? What's that? Uh, I don't think it matters. I use the shiny side, but I don't think it makes a bit of difference. Maybe it photographs a little better with the shiny side. And then we had another back there. That's a good question, and nobody knows the answer. Um, there's a, um, the question is, why do psilocybin mushrooms make psilocybin? And there's a few theories, but none of the theories really uh, seem to make any sense. Um, some people say that it's for protection against insects, but psilocybin mushrooms seem to have insects as well. Um, and you know, maybe it's just random. In nature, there's a lot of things that can be random, and as long as it's not too costly for the organism to make the psilocybin, that won't be selected against. Um, so it could just, you know, there's a lot of very random chemicals in mushrooms, a lot of very mysterious chemicals, a lot of chemicals that have not been discovered yet. And psilocybin can just be one of those random, mysterious chemicals that mushrooms make. Um, it's also possible that they're a neurotransmitter because it's very close to serotonin, and that's a very important molecule in plants as well. And these tryptamines are chemical signaling um, things very often, so it could be some sort of signaling thing. Um, but really, nobody ever knows, and my guess is that nobody will ever know. Debbie? Psilocybin mushrooms are probably the most effective treatment for depression by far. Um, if you go, you know, the pharmaceutical route, there's like, you know, there's all those antidepressants, but they don't really work. 
Um, all of the antidepressants, all they really do is make you not feel as much. And that's maybe good if you're really kind of going nuts. But if, you're, um, if you just have depression, you know, not feeling is not a good way to get out of your depression. So psilocybin mushrooms are very unique in that you would just take, um, take them and then your depression can go away for days, weeks, months, or sometimes even years afterwards. Um, and also it's really interesting that, you know, if you take a lot of psilocybin mushrooms, you'll probably feel really good the next day, like a new perspective on life. But you don't actually have to take a lot of psilocybin mushrooms to, um, to feel better. And, you know, growing up, I always used to think that the whole point of psilocybin mushrooms was to trip. And so I would take a whole bunch and, you know, feel really uh, intense. And, you know, that was fine. Um, but then recently I've met some friends and they just, um, they don't really use them that way. They just eat like a little bit. And I tried that and it works really well. So these days when I eat psilocybin mushrooms, usually I don't even eat that much. Um, what I like to do is just eat like a quarter of a cap. So I try to eat about as much, whereas if I ate twice as much, I would start to feel funny. And um, what I notice is that I feel a lot less depressed and I feel like more at peace with society. And I don't get annoyed at people nearly so easily. Um, you know, if there's some idiot in traffic, I don't really care. I'm like, I, I got a minute, that's no, no big deal. Um, so I think they're, they're really good for mental health. And um, people, there's really a lot of depression, um, you know, in, in society these days. And, you know, most people that are depressed, they don't even realize they're depressed. Um, they just sort of like, uh, they just don't feel good. They just don't feel like doing anything. So if you don't feel like doing anything, you're not going to feel better. Um, but I got kind of in a rut like that maybe a month ago. I was in Mexico and like the rains kind of stopped and I just like didn't really feel like doing that much. And... Um, I was just like messing around and not really making good use of my time. And then I found some psilocybin truffles and I ate one just for the heck of it and I didn't really think it would do anything and it didn't. But then the next morning I woke up and I was just like, wow, I have all this work to do. And I just sat down and started doing my work and it was like really fun and engaging and it felt really great to do it. And after about three hours, I realized that the reason that I was doing my work is because I ate that little bit of psilocybin the night before and you know, I had completely forgotten about it, but it just completely changed my perspective. And um, so, yeah, it's a really valuable thing. Uh, yep. So, um, for those people that are on antidepressants, they go to inhibitors, or your uh, your epinephrine, <clears throat> zero uh, reuptake. Do you then have to wean yourself off before using psilocybin, or can you use them together? Do you have to worry about serotonin overload? I don't think you need to worry about serotonin overload. That's more of a MDMA type of thing. Um, but yeah, if you're on a lot of these um, SSRIs especially, and maybe some of the other ones too, a lot of times psilocybin mushrooms just don't work. And sometimes people will take more psilocybin mushrooms um, and they kind of overpower that effect and it'll work. Or other times they just have to stop using them for a while before they can take the mushrooms. Yeah, okay. Yeah, um, yep, right there then. Um, so in my neighborhood, there's, there's some uh, wood chip areas that I've been checking, and uh, I find different mushrooms. And I found, like, the, the ones you were saying that are these, uh, the ones that have the red caps that are kind of... Uh, the red my series. Yeah, so is it... Is it, a, is it a good strategy to, to, I've got a good area, I'm always checking these, what, if, if I haven't seen any of the ones you're, you're, you're showing in that area, should I, is it better to, to, just, to just move on and try another space, or will, the, will they at some point potentially come up, I mean, if, they're, if they haven't been there so far in the season? Um, if you should just keep checking these areas because a lot of times the mycelium would be kind of dormant or there'll be kind of a small patch or just like a late fruiting patch and there might be nothing there but you come back in a couple of weeks and there could be like a really good patch fruiting there so definitely keep checking that area but even more importantly check new areas um, and the kind of areas you want to check are the kind of places that a lot of people go through. So college campuses, I think, are the best, um, especially in the North Bay. There's like way more psilocybin mushrooms than there are people looking for them in the North Bay. Um, so um, definitely um, 
college campuses there. I found a lot near hospitals because hospitals like to put down wood chip landscaping and it gets irrigated. Um, probably the biggest, best place to check is industrial parks. Because these industrial parks, you know, they all have the same landlord, the same gardeners for this massive area. And so they'll put down tons of wood chips and they'll irrigate them. And sometimes they'll just be like more than you could possibly carry in some of these places. And you can kind of see the red wood chips from Google Earth um, sometimes too. Um, so it's definitely check your old spots, but check new spots and check them more often. And you definitely got to put the work in. I mean, if you just go look at a few wood chip areas and get frustrated, you're not going to find them. You just got to go out there and keep looking and looking and you know, block out four hours, six hours, just to check hundreds and hundreds of wood chip areas. And every mushroom that you see growing out of wood chips is an indicator species for psilocybin mushrooms. Yep, to the right. As an alternative to just hunting for them, could you if you had some, just kind of plant the mycelium around? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of ways to grow mushrooms. And the best way to grow them is with sterile technique, which involves a pressure cooker and um, usually like a still air box and uh, sterile transfers. So um, when you do that, you can use really nutritious medium that's full of sugars and starches. And by keeping it very sterile, you only have the psilocybin mycelium growing there. And that's the best way, but it's also time consuming and energy consuming and it takes uh, some practice. So there's a lot of ways to cultivate them that do not require sterile work. And when you, when you do these things that don't require sterile work, you'll have much less success for sure because there will be hundreds of different fungi back competing with all the bacteria. But at the same time, maybe you've only invested 10 seconds into your cultivation attempt. So it still you know, could work and often does. Um, so a lot of times what I'll do is if I find mushrooms that are really old, like they've turned black already, they might smell nasty, they're, they're too old to eat, they're full of spores. So you can take that and put it in a water bottle and shake it up really good and then just find some new, brand new wood chips, maybe in your yard, maybe out in the city park and just dump that water on the brand new wood chips and very often they'll come up there and it doesn't take very much time at all to do it that way. And of course the stem butts, you know, when you pick a mushroom, plant the stem butt in the other wood chip patch you know, the next one over. Um, if everyone does that, then the more pickers we have, the more psilocybin mushrooms there will be um, all over the place. If you're doing that, w would you want to pick the kind of chips? Uh, hardwood is probably the best, but really any wood, um, you know, they really like the lignin a lot. So, um, yeah, but if you, if you get your, your choice, alder, oak, maple, birch, cherry, walnut, Something like that. Uh, really, that works with any mushroom. It could be poisonous mushrooms, hallucinogenic mushrooms, edible mushrooms, but definitely, um, you know, Psilocybe cyanescens, Psilocybe elenii is the most popular uh, to do that with. Um, but if you're trying to grow oyster mushrooms that way, then you would put it on you know, the, the habitat that you would expect to find those. So you just take the spores of the mushroom and put them in the correct habitat where you expect to find the mushroom. Um, just kind of helping the mushroom distribute the spores, but knowing, using what we know about its habitat to figure out where to put the spores to make it grow best. Uh, Psilocybe cyanescens and Psilocybe elenii would be the most common. Um, in the blue. Hey, just wait for the mic, please. I got you. I'm coming. Are there situations where you have to be careful of uh, poisonous mushrooms in the area of uh, edible mushrooms or psychedelic mushrooms? Like if their mycelium can be able to affect each other? Um, no, the poisonous mushrooms will not turn the edible mushrooms poisonous just by being nearby. Um, the only thing you got to watch out for is maybe picking the wrong one. So I have seen like deadly Conocybe filaris, just one centimeter from psychoactive Psilocybe elenii in wood chips in San Francisco. And to me, they look very different, but maybe if you're in a hurry, um, you, you wouldn't notice the difference. Uh, but even the deadly mushrooms, they're not so deadly that just eating one is going to kill you. You would have to eat like a whole big batch of them. So that's why people don't get poisoned that often from them. Uh, yep, here. Sure. Um, yeah. How about, real, real quick. How about uh, wouldn't uh, psilocybin be fairly ha happy with cardboard as a media, and it would be much more selective? 
than a sugar-based media. Yeah, cardboard is something that people grow psilocybin on. The thing about cardboard is it doesn't work very well. So it does work, and the reason that it doesn't contaminate very much is because there's not much sugar, there's not much carbohydrate. So it does kind of work, but it never really takes off all that well. So you can give it a try, but you're gonna have a lot better luck with a more sterile method. Um, and also like egg cartons are really good. So you could put a stem button in each little thing of the egg carton. And, um, and, that, and then once the egg carton totally colonizes, then you could just bury the egg carton in fresh wood chips outdoors and that would take off pretty well. And then just to the right. Um, what's the best way to prepare like psilocybin mushrooms for consumption? Uh, the best way to prepare psilocybin mushrooms? I think the best way is to make a tea because the alkaloids are very water soluble. So um, you can just like powder the mushrooms or grind them up and then toss them into boiling water and don't even have to boil it for very long. And then I like to use fresh ginger because psilocybin often kind of upsets your stomach because your stomach runs on serotonin and it confuses the serotonin system on your stomach. So fresh ginger makes the tea taste really good and um, also, you know, it kind of settles your stomach a little bit. And the tea makes it hit a little bit faster, but it also wears off a little bit faster. So it's like a um, little bit quicker than eating them. Um, but really, there's no wrong way to eat them. If you just eat the mushrooms, they'll work, but some people have sensitive stomachs. Um, I think it's usually best to eat them on a full stomach because then your blood sugar is like really, you know, not crashing during the trip, and that's important to keep you in a good mood is to have good blood sugar. Um, but one thing that I've been doing a lot recently that's been working really well for me is cooking them. So when I get fresh ones, um, I'll wrap them in tin foil with butter and garlic and salt and pepper and some vegetables and maybe edible mushrooms too, and throw them on the barbecue or put them in the fire or bake them in the oven. And they come out, you know, the foil packets keep all the flavor in, and they taste really good that way. And the heat does not break down the psilocybin at all. Um, and it makes it so your body can absorb the, you know, the chitin in the cell walls. If, it, if it's cooked, you know, it makes it more available to your body. And they're just really delicious mushrooms as well. You know, any mushroom recipe, you can substitute fresh psilocybin mushrooms for them. And um, it'll be really delicious. <laughs> um, I, I think um, what we'll do right now is we will go um, take the laboratory tour. And so we can all just go hang out in the laboratory for a while. If you have more questions, you can ask me in the laboratory. And um, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.